Welcome to Royals Church. We are so honoured you have decided to join with us today. We know that whenever we choose to come together, it is an opportunity for the work of the Word to continue to transform us in Christ. So why don't you grab your phone or your notebook and get ready for today's message and join us for another glorious gathering. We're going to have a confession of faith. If you believe what you say, say it, but say it from your heart. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. You need to get a hold of your Bible, whether it's electronic or paper, I don't really mind, whatever it is. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, I'll never be the same in Jesus' name, amen, praise God. Well, time is moving on, so I'm going to be moving on. Uh, I'm going to open this uh, with a verse that God spoke to me down there, I had to go and look for it, got it in here. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, they don't need to put it up. For since the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. All the wisdom of, of this world does not yet know God, never will. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. It pleased God. What, what pleased God? The foolishness of the message. That's the message to see people saved to those who believe. The Jews request a sign, the Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, they look for a sign, but he became a stumbling block. To the Greeks, they wanted wisdom, but he became foolishness. Ah, that doesn't make sense. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Tells, it just puts perspective on who you are and who I am and where God sits in the equation. So the foolishness of preaching, and this morning you will hear the foolishness of preaching. And I say that with all humility, it's the foolishness of preaching that brings people to repentance. It breaks people down. It heals bodies. It delivers people from demonic possessions and oppressions. It provides supernaturally this gospel, this foolishness of this gospel that you would ought to believe something as foolish as a gospel. Hallelujah. So this morning, you will be hearing the Word of God. And that's where we're at. Sermon title for today is Speak the Word Only. Praise God. Key verse is in Matthew 8.8. 8. Key verse, only the key one verse, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Only speak a word. That's the New King James Version. I'll talk about other versions shortly. I did look into all the other versions. I took quite considerable time looking about 50 translations on what they all said. It's quite interesting. They're slightly different, but really, in essence, they say the same thing. Praise God. So I looked at the number of things and I looked at what the consensus of wording was The line that says, but speak the word, speak a word, some translations, 23 translations said, say the word, uh, speak the word, another 13, and there were other words, but they were the key words. Say it or speak it, same thing, praise God. Give a word was only mentioned once, command a word was mentioned once, and order a word was mentioned once. So say, speak, give, or command, order. One translation said, from where you are. In other words, you don't have to change address. You don't have to come to my house. So say, speak, give, command, order, from where you are, the word. Majority of the translation said the word. Say, speak, give, command, order, the word. Majority by far. Some, some translations, only four, said, say a word. In the end, I just put it all together. I said, well, let's get the, all the words that have been used in all translations and see what they come up with. And this, is what it's, this is what I came up with. 
Say, speak, command, order, or give the word or a word from where you are, and my servant, some said boy, my servant boy will be healed. Just say the word, speak the word, command the word, give the word, order the word. Let it come out of your mouth with power and authority. There is authority and power goes out to meet it where it's got to go to. The context of scripture is the story about the centurion servant. Centurion is uh, in verse 5. I just started verse 5. There's a few verses prior, but I, uh, that's good enough for us today where we begin. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. First word is pleading with him. So this one, the centurion is pleading or speaking to Jesus, saying, what is he saying? Lord, my servant is lying at home. Listen to the words, quite serious, paralyzed. And not only is he paralyzed, he can't move, but he's dreadfully tormented. So that, that's an emotional, mental, spiritual problem. Th maybe, we don't know what that means, but perhaps thrashing himself around, not having any peace at any time. And the, this man, the centurion, a man that commands a hundred men in the Roman army, is pleading with a simple Jew. He understood this Jew had power and authority greater than him. Verse 6, Jesus, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Now in verse 7, we have Jesus' response, first response. And Jesus said to him, didn't say it to anybody else, I will come and heal him. He, he wasn't reluctant in the request. And I believe that, that I just want to spend a few moments on that issue with you all because he's never reluctant at a request of this nature. And sometimes we think, well, you know, what are we gonna, which way we got to stand? Stand with one foot up, that might get his attention. We might do that. We might close our eyes. We may pray on our knees. And we're, we're thinking of, you know, does he really want to do this? He didn't hesitate in his response. I will come and heal him. That, that's really unambiguous. You can take it at face value. Faith operates in realms of surety. It's a guaranteed word. The centurion, in verse 8, second time he speaks to Jesus, answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. You are too great to come under the... One translation I, I noted said... You, it's not right for you to come under even the shadow of my roof, not even into my roof, into my house, but if, if I'm not worthy for the shadow of my roof to fall on you. That's the understanding this Roman centurion had. Hallelujah. Praise God. Only speak a word in my servant. In other words, right where you are, say it without moving. Verse 9. The centurion speaks about how he speaks to soldiers. He spoke to Jesus twice. Now we hear how he speaks to soldiers. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. That's what he says as a commander-in-chief of a hundred. When he says something, it's done. People run to do what he says. He's in charge. He's the boss. Praise God. And so he's establishing understanding in front of everybody but for Jesus. I understand what authority looks like. You know, pause button. I'm going to just digress from my notes. Authority, if you do not understand authority, then you don't understand the kingdom. This is what this man brought out. If you are, you know, I could ask you questions that I don't need answers. Only for your benefit, I'm asking you, who do you answer to? A famous preacher who fell many years ago, a friend of mine went to him before he fell. He knew something was wrong, and he went to him, to this famous, world-famous preacher, and he went to him and said, he had a meeting because he felt so uncomfortable, flew to the place internationally, sat in the office with a bunch of other people, and had only one question he said, I want to ask. There's nothing else. He said, I want to know who can say no to you. And they laughed. They didn't, nervous laughter filled the room. 
and he can say no to this place. Oh, who could say? And nobody really answered the question. There was nobody could say no. Nobody could bring a word of correction, adjustment or anything. And it wasn't very long before that person unfortunately fell and fell spectacularly. My point is that every person needs to be under authority. Every person, you need to know who you answer to, who can say no to you, and you actually do, like the centurion says, I understand my kingdom, the Roman kingdom, but because I understand that, I understand the kingdom of God. So who can say no to you? Are you an independent authority? Well, I'll take, if it suits, and I think what you're saying is right, I'll do it, but if you don't, if I don't, it's sort of like, I'll just flick it to the side. You are not under authority, you're an authority to yourself. And if you are an authority to yourself and you do what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it, Brenda, I'm sorry if I'm speaking too, la- too quickly for you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for doing what you do. Praise God for our hearing impaired ministry here. Praise God. I know how hard that can be. I watch how quickly she goes and she does a great job. Praise God. But we need to be under authority. See, if we actually can come under authority, then God will actually give us authority with other people who will look up to you, that you will be their authority. There's a chain of command. You know, the word Salvation Army is a church called Salvation Army here in Cairns and around the world. And that army has a very distinct, clear uh, levels of authority. You know exactly who you answer to. And I believe we do in this house. We may not be running like that, but we know who answers to who, what level of leadership. But if you actually are a lone ranger and you do your own thing in your own time, in your own way, then you can never be the centurion person of whom Jesus said, I've never seen faith like this in no, not in all of Israel. You're an Italian, but I can see greater faith in this Italian than I can see in any Jew in Israel because he understood the principle of authority. Lift the pause button. Hmm. How many people said, thank you, he's moving on. (laughs) Hallelujah. So when Jesus heard it, he marveled. Now, I don't know what you think marveled, you know, when Jesus marveled. Jesus is the word, is the creator of the universe. Nothing should surprise him and catch him off guard. But this man caused Jesus, the Son of God, the Word of God, to stop like in awe and marvel. Whoa, I've never, ever heard anything like from anybody ever in my life. If Jesus can be in awe and marveling at the words, so he heard it, he marveled, three things. He heard the the Roman soldier, he marveled, second thing, and then he spoke to those who followed him. He heard, he marveled, and then he spoke. Assuredly, guaranteed, 100% in good old Aussie vernacular, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. No Jewish person has measured up to this level of faith. Because he understood authority, because he was under authority and he had had authority over, he knew where he sat in the authority structure. You know, I repeat in leadership teachings most of my life, I'll keep repeating three areas of ministry, praise God. Our value is identical. Look around the room and you say, nobody's worth any more than anybody else because he bought us with the same price called the blood. So don't look around thinking, oh, Maybe me. You can talk. Let's talk about me. You can think about me now. Don't look at me, said Kath. Somebody didn't even get that. Went over your heads. You might think I'm of more value because I'm doing what I'm doing this morning. Or anyone in the church. But the Word of God says we're of equal value. We've been bought with the same price. Ministry is, Paul said, it is unwise. Fools compare one against the other. Well, you know, that preacher, that visiting speaker, they're the best. You know when you get that, they're the best? There's always another best coming along. Couldn't be the best. God said it's foolishness, idiocy, stupidity to compare ministries because if you do, you will switch off when certain people get up and you say, well, I don't like them, not going to get much out of them, and you won't get anything out of them. But if you lean in to every person who gets up, 
You lean in to listen with the ears, hear you as ears, let him hear what the Spirit says. You lean in to every speaker, not the ones you like and the ones you don't like. You lean into every speaker. That goes for singers and musicians and communion and, you know, giving and all those things and other things and whatever we do, guest speakers included. So value is equal. Ministry should never be compared. Oh, he's better, she's better, they're worse. Forget it. Unbiblical carnality rules and reigns in your life if you are a person who sits in the seat of judgment and you compare people. Amen? Last but not least, why I'm bringing those two things, now the third item, authority is completely unequal. In this room, in church life, we are completely unequal because authority is given as you grow in God. It increases or decreases. At the end of your life, it, you know, the graph often goes at the top of the authority scale, but then gradually it starts to diminish and go down, and eventually at death it's zero. That's a good place to stop having authority. <laughs> Hallelujah. Authority is unequal. In a business place, at a school, there is a principal and then there's a, a assistant or a vice principal and then there's a committees and then there's teachers on the ground. And, but, you know, above the principal is a education department and then there's a minister of education and above the minister of education is a premier or a prime minister. There is no stopping on the... You, you submit to authority levels every day of your life. When I go out and drive on the street, I can't do 100 kilometers an hour on Mulgrave Road because I am under authority. As a greater authority will stop me. Thank God for that. That's for our good. So authority is unequal. And if you do not have honor and respect for every level of authority... You know, there are times the person above you may be younger, a lot younger than you, but you know, God doesn't measure it in age. He measures it in submission to the authority over you. It doesn't matter whether the person over you is younger. doesn't matter. They don't have to be super old, like 185 years old before he's, oh, I think I could submit to them, but nobody else. That is a fallacy and a lie. You got to learn to submit to every level of every area of church life as much as you have to learn it in the world, secular world. Yay? I'm not shouting me down with great amens there, but that's all right. I know who I am and I know in Christ what I'm saying. So praise God. Jesus spoke to the followers first time and in verse 11, and I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham. East and west means other nations that we're praying for tonight will be some of them. They'll come and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, some of the Jewish people of that day, they will be cast out into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They missed the moment they couldn't identify their true authority like the Roman centurion did. And then Jesus turns the last time. It's the second time he addresses the centurion. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed the same hour. Jesus didn't go there. Nothing, you know, we use many methods, and the Bible talks about many methods. Lay hands on the sick, there's one method. Anoint with oil is another method, and so on. There, Jesus spat in one guy's eyes that were blind, and they got healed. Another time, he spat in the dirt. He made, mixed his spit with the dirt, made mud, and put the mud in his eyes, and his, he said, go and wash. And only when he washed, he got healed. Uh, Naaman, the Syrian general commander, went and bathed, Baptized, I call it, seven times in the Jordan River. And on the seventh time he came out, methods, God can use whatever methods he likes. Speak the word only, in this case, was the method. No oil, no hands, no bathing, no going to wash in the, you know, in the river, nothing. Just speak the word. That's why he said, I've never found faith like this, because this faith actually still works. So he never went to the centurion's house that we know of, but the same hour, the same time that Jesus released the word, he was healed. So now we're going to do our three areas I just want you to take note of. Number, point number one, 
If you are going to speak the word, before you speak anything, you better know the word you speak. Know the word. That's my first point. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, out of the Amplified Version, this is what it says. Study and do your best to present yourself to God approved. That means it's possible to be disapproved by God because of no word. He said, well, how did you get approved? Study and do your best to present yourself to God approved, comma. Next point, a workman tested by trial who has no reason to be ashamed. If you've studied the word, you've got the word, you've memorized the word, you meditate on the word. I could have used, I was going to use meditate as part of this process today. I left it out, but I'll mention it in my first point. Meditate on the word who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. Timothy is an upcoming pastor, evangelist, disciple of Paul. He said, if you want to be that, if you want to be, are you just going to be a wannabe or you're going to be? You've got to make up in this house today, you've got to make up your mind whether you are going to be or you are going to be. You're really going to be. And the only way you're going to be is to get the Word of God inside of you. I don't mean once, a, you know, maybe you think coming to church on Sunday is getting the Word in you. Of course it is. But that is poor, poor, poor. That is lazy, lazy, lazy. That is nothing, nothing, nothing. You don't do, if you did that with your food from Monday to Saturday, I'd say, okay, tick the box, you're okay. I don't eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, morning tea, afternoon tea, no fruit, no tea, no coffee, Renita, everything, nothing. They don't eat anything, Renita. If they did that, I would say, okay. But because you know how to feed your natural body many times a day, and you don't want to read the word, study the word, memorize the word, and you still want to walk in the power, the authority of God, not going to happen. So I'm telling you very bluntly that you have to be in the word. Every day, Daniel stopped three times a day in the Old Testament. He wasn't even the understand. He's a man of God. He's in heaven. But he wasn't what we understand born again. And yet he stopped three times a day to connect with God. Now, you've got to work out what works for you, but no less than every day, you need to stop and get the Word of God into you. In 2 Timothy 2.15, you know, to be diligent, present yourself approved to God. A worker does not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Rightly dividing means I don't get confused with doctrines that people bring me that are ungodly. The cults operate out of that basis. The cults bring words that are disconnected, wrongly applied and that you end up with a cult mm. point number two so the first point was know the word point number two Jesus could not speak to the issue of the centurion servant boy best as we understand it was a boy unless Jesus actually knew the word so the word was already in him and he said speak the word See, the word sitting inside of you is ineffective in application unless you speak the word. This morning, those words are knowledge. I need to imagine saying, oh, I know some secrets, but I, I really don't feel like I can tell you. I've got words of knowledge. You'd be thinking, what words of knowledge has he got? Why is he not telling us? So you've got to release the word. I want to tell you, every time I do that, I'm in fear and trepidation of God. Not you, not man, not flesh, in fear and trepidation of God. Because I don't want to be wrong in front of him. I want to get this right. I want to hear right. I want to speak right so that we got it right. And that God can move on people. You know, God can do something for the people that were prayed for this morning. Quite a few people received prayer in one way or another. So speak the word. In John 11, 43 to 44, it says, Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. If Jesus had not said the words, Lazarus, come forth, he could have stood in front of that tomb with a, with a stone over the entrance, and he could have wrung his wrists and said, I waited four days because I believe that he will rise from the dead and I'm just waiting for him to come out and push that stone out by himself. Like Samson. He didn't do that. 
The word he had was from God. God put a word in his father, put a word by the spirit in his heart. And he knew it four days at least before Lazarus had died. Actually more because he was dead four days when he got there. He heard the news when he was sick. So it could have been a week. Which reminds me that seven days without prayer makes one week. You've got to throw them in every now and then, though, yeah? Is that right? Every now and then, you've got to throw them in. So he spoke the word out of his mouth, Lazarus, come forth. That's one thing. And he, he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. So we don't know how he moved, but it's likely that he was, somehow he got himself up. They moved the stone, Lazarus come forth, and somewhere the obedience in the realm of the spirit, the miracle working power of God brings him back to life. His spirit comes into his body. He sits up and struggles to himself to his feet, but it's likely that he came out shuffling because they usually wrap the cloth around his feet and around. He couldn't even see where he was going because he had grave clothes around his head. But he came out like looking like, a bit like a ghost. You'd want to run from a scene like that. But Jesus didn't run because it says he and he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with a cloth. How he, you know, it's a supernatural miracle that he come out the door, out the entrance. Can't walk, can't see, but I'm coming. Because obedience. He said, come forth. He didn't say, go and smash into the back wall. He didn't say, go trip and fall over to the left or to the right. <coughs> he said, come forth. And so the dead man obeys the spoken word of God. You've got to speak this word, praise God. And then, hallelujah, Jesus said to them, now he's speaking to the people. He spoke to Lazarus, and then he spoke to people around him, his disciples and his uh, Mary and Martha and whoever else was around. He now gives humans, man, instructions. He said to them, loose him and let him go. Take the cloth off his face so he can open his eyes. And, and th who knows what the first sight that he saw, what it looked like. Might have been Jesus glowing in glory. Maybe that's all he saw when he opened his eyes. Ah, oh, he's here again. Uh, no wonder. It's all okay. It's Jesus. He said, take the, the robe off his face and unwind that cloth that's around him. So he spoke twice and twice. One, the dead man rose and walked out in obedience, correctly out of the entrance with his eyes closed. And then he speaks to people. And there are times you've got to speak to God, you've got to speak to sicknesses, you've got to speak to people. Jesus did. So you've got to speak the word, but you can't speak anything. You've got to speak what God is telling you. And God told him, he said, tell them, loose him. That's a good word. That means he's bound. Loose him. Mm. And what? Loose. If you loose, let him go. And it wasn't long after they were sitting at the table and the lamb chops came out and the lamb raxberry and baked potato and pumpkin and lettuce and cheesecake and who knows what else was on that amazing. I'm sure that they would have sat there and Mary and Martha just keep staring at Lazarus, like sitting right beside him at the end of the table. Lazarus, I can't believe it. You're acting. Jesus, did you, I, I don't have to ask, I know what you did, I just, I'm in awe. Lazarus, I am so, um, I just cannot believe, but I have to believe because you're actually here. I wonder what processes went on for the next 24 hours. What would you like to eat? What's your favorite food? You know those sort of moments when someone's been really ill and sick? It's, what would you like to eat? You were sick for so long and you died and now you're back. What can we make you? Anything special? I would. I think that's what I'd be thinking. Would you be thinking that, Pastor Fitra? What would you make Lazarus? Lazarus, what would you like? And you know what? There's nothing you wouldn't do to get the ingredients to make Lazarus a first-class happy meal. Not a happy packer's meal, but a happy meal. A meal that made him happy. I can tell you there are some meals... Pastor Fitter will tell you that make me extremely happy. There are certain foods that just really make me laugh a lot. Not really. I just enjoy it. 
Wonderful leap, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Revelations chapter 1, verse 16, it says, Out of his mouth went a two edged sword. That's when he, John saw him, the first part of the vision. But in Revelation 19, uh, verse 11 to 16, Christ is riding on a white horse. And uh, he looks, now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful, true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Well, his eyes, imagine this, you can't, it's hard to imagine. His eyes were like a flame of fire. He talks about passion for the kingdom, passion for holiness, passion for purity, passion for cleansing this planet of all the evils that we're dealing with even as we speak. His eyes were like flame, a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He couldn't work it out what that name was. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. It's his blood, and his name is called the Word of God. His name, his name, his name. He is the Word working on the inside of me and working on the inside of you. Work, the Word is working inside out. Something shift on the inside to change you on the outside. He's coming back to the whole planet as the, his name. He's called, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Verse 15, and now... Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp, two-edged sword, just like it was in chapter 1, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. I want to tell you, when Jesus leaves heaven with the armies of God and the two-edged sword, if you don't get what that means, because some people don't, they say, oh, what does that mean? You think he's got a physical sword? It's not a physical sword. As he's coming from heaven to earth, one thing will be resounding in space and it'll reach planet earth and we will hear it. For those that are here, I believe in God to be in the army coming back with him. If you're not ready for that, then you'll be waiting for him to come. Hope you're ready to go before that. But when he comes, what the sword coming out of his mouth, a two-edged sword, he'll be quoting and declaring the word of God so powerfully it will resound, it will shake the atmosphere and nobody will be able to hide from him. And they'll close their ears. The word of God says as he gets closer, he's gonna, they're going to cry out to cover us, hide us from his glory and they're going to run into caves and dens and they're going to they're gonna ask for the rocks to fall on them to stop the noise, the sound of the, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. I am coming. I am the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I'm coming with power. I'm coming to judge the earth. I'm coming by the power. I'm, you, you know, the world, it's going to be endless Word of God. Word, Word, Word. He's coming out of His mouth. Shakes the planet. We haven't seen the fear of God until that moment when it's going to be one of the greatest, most fearful moments in the history of the world. Out of his mouth goes a two-edged sword. He's speaking. See, this number two point was speak the word. Well, I promise you, at the second coming, he himself, the word, will be speaking amplification through the universe. Everything will vibrate and shake at the sound of the voice of the Word of God, the Son of God, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Then the world will cry out, hide us from His glory. Visually, they're blinded. Audibly, they can't stand it. They're going to be cringing and running in every direction. How do you think if you read Revelations, what does it mean when 200 million army is gathered in the army of Armageddon? They're ready. They're waiting for Him to come, to fight Him in the air with ballistic missiles and nuclear missiles and modern technology and Star Wars technology. We've got all the technology. We've got 200 million. But they never banked on the sound of his voice so loud, reverberating everywhere. You can't get away from it. And the Word of God says that he destroys them with the brightness of his glory. They won't be able to see each other and they won't be able to think. They will turn on each other. How do you think... 200 million people are destroyed. They will turn on each other because they'll be from many nations and they don't trust each other. 
They're going to turn on each other in blindness. They can't see and they can't think. The word, the word, the word, the word that's coming, the word of God piercing their minds, their ears. They can't stand any of it. That's a picture of the end of this phase of history and the beginning of the kingdom of God, a thousand-year reign of Christ. Hmm. Point three. First, tell me what the first point was. Second point was? Third point is, you don't know it, but I'll tell you, believe the word. If you, see, hearing the word, it didn't profit them the Word of God says, because it wasn't mixed with faith. It wasn't in the Spirit. Oh, it's like, I know, one and one makes two. Yeah, that's good. I know what the script. No. Believe. Point three, believe. Luke chapter 8, verse 49 to 56 is the entire portion, but I'm just going to pick on verse 51. When he came to the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, John, and the father and the mother of the girl. Praise God. Verse 50, just prior to that, why he shut the doors on everybody who did not believe. Verse 50, but when Jesus heard it, they were saying, she's dead, don't bother the teacher. He wasn't listening to their words, he was listening to the Father's word. He heard it, he, be- he had it in his spirit, he spoke it, he's speaking now what he really wants to set the scene of faith. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus. And he not only... He knows the word, he speaks the word, but he believes his own word. And he said in verse 50, he said, do not be afraid, bold letters for me, only believe. That's all you got to do, and she will be made well. And then he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, John, and the father and the mother of the girl, and they shut the door on all the unbelief. See, you cannot have miracles with unbelief. You can't have miracles where the church doesn't believe the Word of God or the church doubts. There's fear, doubt, unbelief, the three related cousins. Fear, doubt, and unbelief, don't believe any. Oh, no, it couldn't. Well, it could happen. It did happen a long time ago. Don't know if God still does that. We've got churches that actually have doctrines that don't believe that the power of God is for today. They don't believe in healing, deliverance, supernatural miracles. They have written that into their doctrinal dogma and constitutions and you know if you actually step out of that and you step into this what I'm talking about many people have been asked to leave church so don't expect miracles in an atmosphere of unbelief Jesus locked out the unbelief in his day he put them all verse 54 it says he put them all outside and then he took her by the hand saying little girl arise believe is faith Only believe means have faith. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he shall lead, guide and direct your paths. Hallelujah. Obedience. What about believe is obey? When God says something, just do it. You know, Nike, just do it. Wear the shoes, got the shirt. Well, do it then. Don't just look at sport and sporting arenas. I've got nothing against that. But more importantly is do it. If he tells you to do it, do it. This morning, those words I gave, I gave because I heard and I had to release them. I did it. I I can't be held fully responsible for what God does, how he does it, for any individual, but I am responsible. He speaks to that me regularly. You are responsible to release those words. I am responsible to fulfill them. So only believe is to have faith, trust, obey, and come into line with him. When you are aligned with God, everything is possible. All things are possible when you believe. Hallelujah. With man, you know, it is impossible. Scripture says that. But with God, all things are possible. What is it that's impossible in your life? I say to you, the Word of God says, align yourself with God. Get the word inside of you, know the word, speak the word, believe the word, and you will see shifts and changes in your life. So, Father, right now, Father, I've released this word, Lord, end of August, 
Father, the word that you've put in my heart, Father, I've released it, I've spoken it, I've said it, Lord, as the way you wanted me to say it, Lord, and today, Father, let it be sealed, God, by the blood of Jesus, by the name of Jesus, by the word of Jesus, by the spirit of Jesus. Seal it up in the hearts of your people. Father, you said that your, your word, your fire, of your word is sealed up in the bones of your servant. Seal it in the bones of your people that your people may rise up and know the word, speak the word, believe the word, and see the supernatural released and unfolded in their natural lives, spiritual lives, relational lives, business lives, whatever the application is. Hallelujah. In Jesus' awesome and wonderful name. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus. Just bow your heads, close your eyes. I have a question to ask. I'll do this because I believe in doing this because I don't want anyone to miss out. It's not a magic wand. It's not a silver bullet. It's the beginning of a journey with God. And tonight, today, if there's anyone here that doesn't know God, you know that your life you are not in the Word, you're not in prayer, you're not in the Spirit. You just sort of play around the edges of the kingdom of God. If you want to change that today, say, it's time to change. I want to change my life. I'm going to ask you today, simple, I'll pray with you. Is anybody here, just while your eyes are closed, just give me a wave. Say, Pastor, that's me. I'd like to change my life today. Today I want to respond to the Word of God. The Word of God, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Is there anybody here this morning you want, to, you want your life to change? Okay, I can see one. Thank you. Two. Anybody else? Can I ask both of you to come to the front? Because I want, I want you to pray a prayer with me. I want to pray with you a simple prayer. And whoever's with you, welcome to come. 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 Hallelujah. Just come. Can you come, sister? Praise God. Wonderful Jesus. Praise God. Wonderful Lord. Anybody else? While our sister is coming. Anybody else? You can rip your neighbor with your elbow, especially if it's Barry. So you're right with God. You need to repent, change your mind, get on fire for God. What's your name, brother? Tim. We've met, eh? We've met, yeah, we've met. Last Sunday, yeah. Praise God. Well, you're going to pray this prayer this morning? You're going to mean it with all of your heart? Change life, born again, spirit-filled, name in the Lamb's book of life. How good is that? Praise God. Wonderful Jesus. Hallelujah. Church, you can pray this prayer with them. This is Tim and A Annie. Anne? Anne. Tim and Anne. Praise God. I'm just going to simply ask you to repeat this prayer with me. I can't save you. Only Jesus saves you. Whether you've been in church, out of church, today's the day where you firm up your commitment with God. I want to follow Jesus all the days of my life. Hallelujah. So if you can repeat this prayer with me, the prayer is not to me, not to the house, the building, or a church. The prayer is directly to God. Hallelujah. Repeat this with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner and I need the Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for living independently of you. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. Make me whole, well, and complete in every way. I thank you now that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I thank you, Lord. That according to your word, according to your word, I am born again. I thank you now that I can give you my body as a house for your Holy Spirit to live in. 
I love you. I worship you. I adore you. I surrender my life to you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. And amen and amen. God bless you. My name is Adam Jaffa, and I'm the senior pastor of Royals Church. And I'm so glad that you joined us today around the Word of God. We believe that the Word of God in itself is powerful. It's energized and it's effective and it's reaching right into your heart and right into your home. We can't wait for you to join us again real soon.